We are now delighted to welcome to the stage Kwame Anthony Apia, Professor of Philosophy and Law at NYU and NYU Abu Dhabi. Re-envisioning the museum together. Art museums, indeed the arts generally, have a double connection to your sense of who you are. On the one hand, we find in them works that connect with our own identities. As a child, I loved visiting the museum at the uh, Ghana Cultural Center in Kumasi, where I grew up, uh, where things were in some sense about us, the people of Asante, whose capital Kumasi is. In New York, where I live now, I can see in the Metropolitan Museum too, some of the magnificent things Asante people have made. This is the gold leaf covered head of an Asante linguistic carried by an Ochame, a person who speaks for a ruler. But I've taken great pleasure as well in the experience of going to the great museums on the Museum Enzel in Berlin and around Trafalgar Square in London, or to the Met and the Palais du Louvre or the Kunstisorisches Museum in Vienna. It's the pleasure and excitement I felt the first time I entered the Louvre Abu Dhabi. All of these are places where you can appreciate and learn about and bask in the beauty or the power of the arts of civilizations with which you don't have that kind of connection with a local identity. I like to think of a museum as a place in which you can see, say, a Chinese artifact, not being Chinese yourself, and think of it as, for the moment, yours, transcending the normal divisions of identity that play such a large role in the way people currently think about the arts and about museums. Not that I have lost the desire for connections of identity. I've often found myself looking for an African presence in a museum. In Sao Paulo, for example, I found myself once in an Afro-Brazilian museum with its eerie evocation of the slave ships that brought Africa to Brazil. My presence there had something to do with my own African origins, no doubt. Though the Brazilians who recommended to me clearly think of it as a reflection of their national identity and its deep interconnections with the African cultures from which so many of their ancestors came. It was mine as an African, theirs as Brazilians, and I could enjoy it in good measure, of course, because since I'm not Brazilian, it was teaching me about worlds I didn't know. We live in an age of identity. People everywhere are preoccupied with what it is to be a member of a people. Here in Abu Dhabi today, as in the United States and in Ghana and Britain, countries large like China and India and small like Namibia and Vanuatu, national pride is a powerful cultural and political force. And while many of these countries are new, remember the modern boundaries and the constitution of India was set less than three quarters of a century ago, nationalism in its modern form is several centuries old. And in the development of modern nationalism, art and culture of the sort that's exhibited, studied and celebrated in contemporary museums of art played a central role. At the end of the 18th century in Europe, with the rise of Romanticism, new ideas develop about what it is to be a German or English or Scottish or French. Many thinkers increasingly made a connection between the nation on the one hand and artistic genius on the other. The English poet William Wordsworth, for example, wrote in 1802, um, we must be free or die who speak the tongue that Shakespeare spoke, the faith and morals hold which Milton held. Indeed, the modern ideas of the artistic genius and of a national genius grow together. The individual genius is an expression of the genius of his or her nation. And that is a central part of the way we think about, say, painting. If I say great artist to you, you're likely to think of a figure like Rembrandt and to think of him as an expression of Netherlandish art or of Michelangelo and to think of him as Italian or if you're more scholarly as Florentine. And because the Florentine Republic was absorb absorbed into the Kingdom of Italy in 1861 and then into the Italian Republic, Italians take pride in him just as the Dutch take special pride in Rembrandt's artistic achievements as, as they are as citizens of the Kingdom of the Netherlands to the legacies of the Dutch Republic in the Golden Age. For the great German philosopher Johann Gottfried Herder, who died in 1803, and who's one of the godfathers of European Romanticism, the German nation was not essentially a political institution. 
That's not surprising, since the uh, unification of Germany into the Deutsches Kaiserreich didn't occur until 1871, and the German-speaking lands were a motley of republics, principalities, and kingdoms, uh, many within the Habsburg monarchy that was to become the Austrian Empire. Since there were many people who did not speak German in these states, Polish speakers, for example, it was not defined by geography either. And, uh, um, sorry. It was not defined by geography either. And since the idea of the gene wasn't invented until the 1860s, it wasn't a matter of shared genetics either. Perhaps had a um, did think that the Germans were a people of common ancestry. That's after all why nationalism is imbued with the spirit of fraternity, which is the spirit of family, of common uh, ancestry. But that wasn't what mattered to him most. What he cared about was the nation's shared spirit, its geist. The geist of a folk, a nation, was found, had a thought, most profoundly expressed in the national language and in the arts, in culture. And so the genius of someone like Goethe or Helderlin, for example, but also the genius of the common folk whose stories the Brothers Grimm correct, collected as expressions of German folk culture, all of these were for him important as expressions of the national spirit. For the Romantic nationalists, this was what a nation really was, the embodiment and expression of a geist, something spiritual, intellectual, mental, artistic. That's why nations mattered. And that's why individual creativity mattered, because individual creativity is the means through which the national creativity is expressed. Now, you may be wondering why I'm reciting some of this ancient history. After all, you might think, these ideas no longer shape our responses to art. Well, let's look at a show the Guggenheim Museum in New York mounted earlier in our own 21st century, entitled Spanish Art from El Greco, yep, that means the Greek, to Picasso who lived most of his life in France. The Guggenheim spoke about radical juxtapositions that cut across time to reveal the overwhelming coherence of the Spanish tradition. I don't suppose any visitors were surprised by this talk of a Spanish tradition. So let me ask you to focus on why a painter called Domenicos Teotocopoulos, a man from Crete, that's the bottom arrow down there, who was trained in Venice, that's the second arrow at the top, and who worked in, yes, in Spain, why such a person should be thought to be an embodiment of something essentially Spanish. Now, I'm teasing the curators of the show, not because they've made what I think is a mistake here. I'm teasing them because it's a mistake that tempts most of us when we start thinking about art. Let me make the point quickly in a few images about why this is wrong in the arts generally. Goethe, whom we've met already, is widely agreed to be Germany's greatest poet. One of his poetic cycles is named the West Östlicher Divan, and it's inspired by the poetry of Hafiz, uh, whose tomb in Shiraz is still a place of Persian pilgrimage. And then, just to give another example from the other side of the world, consider Matsuo Basho, the magnificent haiku master of the 17th century, who was shaped to a large degree by Zen Buddhism. That means that Gautama, the Buddha, seen here in a Greco-Buddhist sculpture from Gandhara, is part of Basho's heritage. Now, I've made it sound so far as though Herder and his romantic friends thought that all that mattered about art was its contribution to the national spirit. So you might think I'm going to assign to them the responsibility for the sort of misunderstanding that I accused those uh, curators at the Guggenheim of, the mistake of thinking of art that is in fact transnational in its inspirations and its connections in national terms. And I do think that is partly the fault of these romantic nationalists. But it would be unjust to suggest that they thought that we should therefore pay only attention to art that is from our own nation, only the art of our own Geist. Because at the very same moment, and alongside this way of understanding art and culture as the expression of the national spirit, at the very same time is developed modern cosmopolitanism. Take, for example, George Gordon, Lord Byron, one of those geniuses of romanticism here seen in a particularly romantic picture. He died fighting for the freedom of the Greeks from Ottoman domination. 
Some of you will recall a verse of his about his adopted home. The Isles of Greece, the Isles of Greece, where burning Sappho loved and sung, where grew the arts of war and peace, where Delos rose and Phoebus sprung. Eternal summer gilds them yet, but all except their sun is set. Lord Byron, as you know, wasn't Greek. He was Scottish. And the poetry of Sappho mattered to him, not because he was Greek, like Sappho, but because she had written magnificent poetry. And the point is that romantics like Byron, like Herder, not only celebrated their own national spirit, they also celebrated the spirits of other folks. Herder's nationalism, as I say, was therefore deeply cosmopolitan. And the very idea of cosmopolitan nationalism, which strikes the modern era as a contradiction in terms, is crucial to understanding what's good about this tradition, I think. And that, of course, is the thought that even if you think of art as the product of nations rather than of individuals, you also value the art that's produced by nations other than your own. Herder and Byron shared the sentiment that I said I feel in the great cosmopolitan museums, which is, here I am responding to these objects which are mine as human, not as Ghanaian or British or American, or whatever I'm thinking of myself as in national terms. Now, that excitement about the variety of human art, cultural artifacts is one of the two key elements of the tradition of cosmopolitanism, which stretches back to Diogenes the Cynic in the fourth century, who seems to have been the person who coined the word cosmopolites, citizen of the world. But a second equally important element offers a sort of commentary on what it is to be a moral community because cosmopolitans think that we can accept responsibility for one, for one another while still living lives of very different styles. In fact, cosmopolitans revel in the range and variety of the ways people live and of the things they make and do. And so, unlike many people who think of the world as a moral community, cosmopolitans don't want to change everyone else to fit our own mold. We, I might as well admit that I count myself among the cosmopolitans, we are interested in human, social, cultural, and individual variety. So you might suppose that cosmopolitans should side with those who are busy around the world, preserving culture, resisting cultural interpret uh, in, uh, sorry, resisting uh, cultural appropriation and um, preserving culture. But these notions have some curious assumptions behind them. So let's just take preserving culture. It's one thing to provide people with help to sustain arts they want to sustain. Uh, long live the Ghana National Cultural Center in Kumasi, whose entrance I showed you earlier, where you can go and learn traditional Akan dancing and drumming, especially since its classes are spirited and overflowing. Uh, restore the deteriorating film stock of early Hollywood movies. Continue the preservation of Old Norse and early Chinese and Ethiopian manuscripts. Uh, record, transcribe, and analyze the oral traditions of Malay and Maasai and Maori. All these are a valuable part of our human heritage. But pres preserving culture in the sense of cultural, cultural artifacts broadly conceived is different from preserving cultures. And the preservationists of cultures often pursue the latter, trying to ensure, say, that the Huli of Papua New Guinea keep their authentic ways. But what makes a cultural expression authentic, though? Are we to stop the importation of baseball caps into Vietnam so that the Zhao will continue with their colorful red headdresses? Why not ask the Zhao? Shouldn't the choice be up to them? That's one of the intellectual risks that comes with the idea of the Volksgeist of the national spirit. Once you think of the folk as having a spiritual core, you can be tempted by the thought that people ought to be faithful to the geist they belong to. And that way lies what we often now call essentialism, which involves uh, very often the practice of treating people of some identity as having some core set of practices and norms that they ought to live up to. If all great art made by Germans expresses the German genius, indeed, if that's one of the criteria of great German art, then art that's un-German can't be grace, great unless, of course, it's made by someone undrum. But cultures are made of continuities and changes, and the identity of a society survives through these changes. Societies without change aren't more authentic. They're just dead. Pious talk of the authentic is often, in any case, wonderfully misdirected. 
Someone uh, once told me the story of a collector of recipes who arrived in a Cambodian village yearning for authentic local cuisine. Uh, here's a dish, one of the locals began. Uh, you take smoked tongue of water ox. Uh, well, well, if you can't get uh, smoked water ox tongue, you can use shrimp. Oh, no, no, the visitor said. I want to follow exactly your authentic recipe. Really, said the Cambodian. We only use water ox tongue because we can't get shrimp. Identity matters then in our responses to art as to cuisine. But Herder would have insisted we need to keep hold as well of the other side of the cosmopolitan package, which says every object is indeed an expression of the geist, but human beings need to share the product of their communities across boundaries. Now, I've been discussing this thought that everything is the product of the geist as if I, without questioning it, as if I agreed with it. And let me insist now that this strikes me as one of the great philosophical misunderstandings about the arts. Arts is not made, art is not made by nations or cultures, it's made by people. It may take a lot of people to make a work of art, as it does to make each per performance of Beethoven's Ode to Joy. It requires a large choir of sopranos, altos, tenors and basses, a piccolo, a flute, a cup or two, a couple of oboes and clarinets and bassoons, timpani, bass drum, cymbals, triangle, string instruments of at least four kinds, and I've probably forgotten someone. It takes all those voices singing the right notes and all those musicians playing the right instruments in the right order and blending their sounds together. But still, it's made by them. And the work that they're making, the work that they're expressing, was itself made by a person, Beethoven, one person in that case. A person who operated in an environment shaped by a local culture, but also shaped profoundly, since he was Beethoven, by a whole range of other culture as well. More than this, uh, the way in which the national context informs art is not the way that talk of the Geist suggests. It's not because each artwork belongs together organically with other products of its Geist. The name for that view is organicism, and the right picture of the arts is not organicist. Every element of culture, from philosophy or cuisine to the style of bodily movement, is separable in principle from every other. And you really can uh, walk and talk like an African-American and think with Matthew Arnold and Kant, as well as with Martin Luther King and Miles Davis. Now, there are organic holes in our cultural life. Uh, the music, the art, the words, the set design, the dance of an opera fit together and are meant to fit together. This is, in the word that Wagner invented, a Gesamtkunstwerk, a total work of art. But there isn't one great big whole called culture that unites organically all these parts. Kafka and Miles Davis can live together as easily as Kafka and Richard Strauss. You will find the style of hip hop in the streets of Tokyo. Spain, in the heart of the West, resisted liberal democracy for two generations after it took off in India and Japan, in the East. Jefferson's Western inheritance, Athenian liberty, Anglo-Saxon freedom, did not preserve the United States from creating a slave republic. It's true this become more easily visible, I think, in the last century, because so much of the art that we now value most, especially much of the art that we've produced in the last hundred years, is just profoundly not national. Consider Picasso, caught in this brilliant picture by Man Ray, posing as a romantic genius. This is an artist born in Spain who took inspiration from a Billy figurine from the Congo, shown to him in Paris by a Frenchman, Henri Matisse, at a party at the home of the American, Gertrude Stein, and inspired by it, he and others helped create a new form of art which traveled the world, not just in the sense that it finds audiences everywhere, but also because it provides inspiration to many people, including many contemporary African painters out of African art academies, including in the Congo, where that Vili sculpture started out. That sort of circulation is central to the life of the kind of art we care about. There are reasons for skepticism, surely, about the idea that culture, or at any rate the stuff we care about most, is national in any deep sense. So, 
in remaking the museum for a multicultural, multi-religious world, open to respectful encounters across the many dimensions of our human differences, let's always recall that we can all respond to art that is not in any obvious sense ours. Even in the arts with which we have the most intimate connections, the responses that matter will always include responses that transcend identity. We can only fully respond then to our art if we move beyond thinking of it as ours and think of it as art. Which is why I'm going to end with an image of a museum and an artifact from it that have both thrilled me, though they come from a place and a religion, neither of which I claim as mine. And that book, by the way, is a Mughal version of a Sanskrit classic. Most of our museums don't need new collections to allow us to make connections across identities. The collections are doing that already. Thank you very much.